Hello, I'm Richard Toy and I'm here with Professor Jeremy Black and we're going to be discussing the local and regional press and its historical development. Now Jeremy, you know, in the 18th century the, the local press is a very different affair than it is today. Yes, I mean the local press was essentially uh, weeklies, they were quite short because of the taxes on paper, uh, they were obviously not illustrated, um, but the key thing about them was they didn't have much news about the locality. Right. The assumption was that if you lived in York you would know about what had happened in York in the last week, whereas what you wouldn't know is what had happened further afield. Okay, so who was who was sort of took the initiative in setting up these newspapers and running them? The papers were essentially set up by printer entrepreneurs. So these were local printers who were looking at another way to supplement their activities and to use their presses. And they were part and parcel of the way in which you get a, an extension of, I suppose, what in the jargon would be called public culture, public space, all that kind of language, which has been widely used with some reason for the 18th century. So the kind of individuals that would be producing handbills right. uh, would suddenly turn out to newspapers. Okay, so they've got a lot of, yeah, they've got spare capacity, they're doing other things, and then they think, well, we could use this uh, to you know, run a weekly paper as well. Yep, they've very much got spare capacity, and so also with the distributors. I mean, the distributors were ju largely men that went round the countryside on horses who would be selling a wide range of products, of which newspapers were one. I wonder if I could make just one or two general points at this, uh, this juncture. This point about spare capacity you've made and being part and parcel of a wider business is something that in a very different context confronts the press now. In other words, rather than seeing a newspaper primarily or exclusively as a product that comes out in a certain format, mm -hmm. a newspaper could be seen or a newspaper company could be seen as a way of producing and selling or in some way distributing information in which there is a number number of um, uh, possible mediums. The other general point I'd like to make about the local and regional press is as follows. Most of the narrative of newspaper history, particularly in countries such as Britain or France, which are, have a uh, centralised tradition, has been about the metropolitan press. Right. And indeed, I think it's fair to say that with some exceptions, there's been some good work, obviously, but that most of the books on British newspaper history, particularly overarching surveys, focus on the London press and look at its developments. That is valuable. That is an important topic. But it has led to an underrating and underwriting, in fact, of other forms of newspaper. Well, that's a very interesting point in terms of how the historian one approaches this topic, say the one you know, wanted to do a, an investigation of the origins of the local press and how it changed. Now obviously to a certain extent we've got the papers themselves but then not all of those may have survived quite possibly. Uh, how else, you know, what other kinds of sources would one be using for investigating this? Well you're certainly right about source problems. I mean it was estimated by Cranfield when he did his book on the English press, from some, provincial press I should say, from 1700 to 1760. He estimated that only half of all original copies had survived. In other words, um, we, for many newspapers which we know to have existed because we've seen advertisements for them, there are no known copies or there may be, I once read an article on a Northamptonshire paper on which there was only one known copy of a paper which had had a considerable run. So that's a problem. And as you say, there's a problem of the background sources that we often know very little about other than their names and what else they published as, as printers of the people that produced them. And more generally, the world of provincial politics is very much underplayed. I and mean, there's a tradition, if you look at England, I'm not saying that England is the central country, but it is, after all, the country in which the newspaper press developed most rapidly in the 18th century and indeed in the 19th. If you look at England for the 18th century, you can go back and think that for the background of the Civil War in the early 17th century, there's a whole tradition of county studies. Kent and Leicestershire have been you know, studied extensively. For the 18th century, we have very much less of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a real problem. And insofar as we have studies, they tend to be of individual cities. Norwich, Bristol, Halifax have all been studied. Right. But often the countryside has not been. Mm -hmm. And when we don't really know know very much about the regional or local dynamics of politics or political culture, it's therefore very difficult to understand the pressures that moulded, guided or set the context for the publication of newspapers. And um, the question which relates to that in the sense of the, the, how much influence these newspapers might have had, um, I mean, do we know how many copies were being made 
Piece, we generally right. don't have any re many reliable guides. I mean, in the 18th century, obviously, you've got the stamp tax records, but they're not comprehensive. The usual assumption is that for most provincial newspapers, you might not in the first half of the century have been talking about many more than 200 copies a week. But the assumption generally is that newspapers were read uh, by more than one person. Um, newspapers were most commonly read in taverns, mm -hmm. um, in barber shops where people went to be shaved, which yep. they did very, very frequently, and in coffee houses. And, um, you know, various historians have produced guess estimates of maybe 20 copies, sorry, 20 times an individual copy being read. We also know newspapers are often read aloud. But if we leave that to one side, because the, the question of how many people read a newspaper is not a way necessarily that... It, that comprehensively discusses this issue of influence. I think there's two separate questions. One is, do newspapers influence people with their thesis? In other words, today the Guardian urged its readers to vote for um, Yvette Cooper rather than Jeremy Corbyn for the leadership of the Labour Party. Does that influence people or not? I don't know. That's something one could talk about. But there's a completely separate issue, which is, are people influenced through reading newspapers or today looking at the television or other forms of news, looking at the internet, in order to have a different frame of reference when they are considering the world around them and a frame of reference when they're conceptualising what news means. And I think without a doubt that is the case today, and it was also the case in a different context in the 18th century. Great. Now, I mean, in a sense to kind of broaden out that question of influence and you think about sort of the whole newspaper, as it were, and maybe not everybody sits down and reads the whole thing from beginning to end. Now, you know, to what extent are these carrying adverts at this period? Because um, that might actually be another way in which you influence, the press might have influence. We always think of it as, is it the editorial line that persuades people to go and you know, vote one way or the other? But as you say, this question of worldview, you know, maybe the kind of, you know, the products or the other um, you know, books or newspapers that are being advertised, maybe that is actually part of the way in which people's worldview is shaped. I think that's certainly the case. I mean, if one looks at 18th century advertisements, the pattern of advertisements are different to today. That doesn't mean that the newspapers are less or more important. Essentially, what you're advertising are what one might call uh, distinctive products. In other words, you're not saying to somebody that at Aldi you can buy your baked beans for threepence less than you pay at Tesco's. What you're in a sense saying is that um, the great Jones is coming to Hereford and the great Jones is going to cure people whose sight is obscured. In other words, he's going to do something about cataracts. And this will be a visitor who will be being advertised in that form. And you will advertise also products that come onto the market for example, books, which are classically advertised in newspapers because they're often produced by the same people or they're produced as part of a national network. In the, the, uh, but also, for example, the sale of estates, um, you would be producing distinctive products. The other great thing with the sort of curiosity from our point of view is that people in the 18th century were uh, concerned about their health, as people are today. Um, but of course, it was a much more commercialised world of health in the 18th century than today. And the, as it were, the um, barrier in in terms of expertise. There was no equivalent of nice. So one of the classic things that were advertised were uh, patent medicines. And, you know, particularly, I mean, some of the earliest illustrations are of uh, tapeworms that had supposedly been uh, extruded as a result of somebody <laughs> taking uh, one or other yeah. um, uh, uh, sort of liquid. So those were, again, these were often, dis these were high value, low bulk products, which could be taken around the countryside by the newspaper distributor, uh, that you'd want to be told about them, because this is a new product that's come into your locality, and therefore there is a reason to, uh, to read them in the newspaper. And to that extent, the pattern of advertisements is similar to the pattern of news. It is things that are new or distinctive to the locality, rather than, as today, products that people have been eating or consuming or purchasing in the locality for a very long time, and where the prime thing you're doing is affecting the sales, the sales uh, criteria. Okay, one final question, and I'm not going to ask you to sort of review the whole history of the development of the local press since the 18th century, but in a sense, you know, things did change subsequently. Um, you know, why did they change, do you think? Well, I think that's the, the, way, the way that the press changes in the 19th century is fascinating. I mean, in part, it's um, uh, fiscal regime. In other words, the taxes on knowledge drop. That's very important. Um, in part, it's the complete change in distribution networks following, uh, in particular, the introduction of 
um, both telegraph and railways. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can get news much more readily and then distribute it within your area much more readily. Mm -hmm. Steam printing changes the economics of production. Mm -hmm. And mass literacy, which is provided free by the state as a result of educational methods, creates this mass market. And obviously, again, for the late 19th century, we tend to focus on newspapers like the Daily Mail, which is a very important newspaper in that period. But it's also worth bearing in mind that some of the most dramatic developments is the idea of daily evening papers in all sorts of places, particularly across most of the north of Britain. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.